got Parks and Rec, Library, Capital Programs, Public Utilities, Insurance, Intergovernment, and Debt. Uh, following this, the two groups will break apart and review the budget in their own manner. And we'll come back together on Wednesday, March 17th for reconciliation. So first up tonight, we have Parks and Rec Department. All yours, Pam. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think I know almost everybody here. So I hope um, most of this information is stuff that you guys have known already and are up to speed with. I have my slideshow. There we go. Derek's bringing up. Okay. Can you see it, Pam? Yep, I can. Thank you very much. So this is um, just an overview of our facility two years ago to give you a sense of it in case you haven't been to it recently. Um, and our first one is our staffing. Um, you have myself as a director, Kelly LaFountain, who is 37 and a half hours as our program coordinator. We have our program assistants, which um, we were in a fortunate situation. We didn't have them on an extend or a um, <clears throat> regular payroll. We were kind of splitting the position between two people. And when we went into COVID and didn't need to use them, we have not used them other than when we had certain events going on. So <clears throat> if you look at our current budget, you can see that our part-time payroll hasn't been hardly expended at all because we have not used Nick or Jerry other than during soccer season. Unfortunately, this winter, the school system has not allowed us in the gyms and um, we weren't able to offer open gym or, or any basketball or, ba um, basketball or volleyball programs. So the winter has kind of been idle for us as far as programming um, issues like that. We also have our two parks maintenance staff, uh, Ray Hansen and Barry, and not to mention 25 student and stipend positions and countless volunteers. A lot of our department is healthy and exists because of our volunteer basis as always. Um, value changes, what you see in front of you is our website that we now have. This allows us to, um, it, it saves, it's a game changer as far as time when we normally would have used that other hours in the office to put people in the computer system and to track things and to produce paperwork. This software does everything for us and it's been totally worth the $3,200 that we spend on it every year. Um, it allows us to email groups. It allows us to make coaches rosters. It allows us to give all that information out to everyone. We got a lot of things accomplished this year with COVID. Um, money that has been sitting for a while, the basketball resurfacing took place um, and that was a life saver this summer for kids. We offered a lot of basketball programs there and did skills. And after fall started, there were countless days where kids were out playing basketball and using the, the courts. Um, at the same time, we were able to give the uh, contract out. Um, well, actually in June, we gave the contract to Favro um, Lighting and then Favro picked up a state bid for COVID lighting and they weren't able to complete it. So I um, called Enterprise Electric and said, would you be willing to match this, the bid that they gave us? And then because Enterprise Electric is a LED, uh, L-E-E-D, I believe that's the pr proper um, notification, our company, they were able to actually upgrade our lights for us. And we now have, um, Matt, help me. <laughs> My head's in a different place right now. Um, certified? Yeah. So um, he got his wish. And then... The other accomplishment we did this year is the next page. And we were able to do put the new Nexus server and software in and we're able to stream live and broadcast. So 
Some other good things we had this fall is we offered um, the uh, trick or treat um, trunkathon at the fairgrounds. We were able to have kids sign up 25 at a time with their parents. And we had a huge response from the community, as you can see. Um, we had lots of staff and lots of em employees support us. Um, I tried to kind of share their pictures here so that you might be able to pick some strangers out there. Um, but it was a great response. And we actually ended up having about 225 kids go through trick-or-treating. And we've gotten a lot of response from people asking us if we'll continue to do this um, because it was such a huge success. <clears throat> and then the other item we did, that was new this year, we became creative with what we could do as we worked together with the fire department, the police department and the solid waste facility as well as the finance department. And we provided a, <clears throat> uh, we escorted Santa through town and this was about a three and a half hour process. We were able to go up and down the streets, we mapped it out Planning helped us by mapping everything out. That's Andrew DC's creative work with Santa's cap on our logo. Um, and we provided a map to everybody. And we counted as we went around and we saw over 950 residents that day. So that was a huge success. Other things that we've done this year, we, um, and you'll see an adjustment in our ski program in the budget is that we did um, go to direct payment to Lost Valley. So now people who sign up with us go on to Lost Valley and pay for the program. And then they give us a reimbursement check after the program's completed. We had more people this year in the winter at Lost Valley. We had just 60 um, skiers. We sold passes and um, lessons to parents and kids. And they could drive up, take their lesson. They could be there for the night on Friday night for five hours and um, things went fairly successful. I know there were a few people that went last week for the free ski at the mountain. The other thing that um, we're having increase in, well actually, and the other thing we did this year and it was it was a huge success this year because of COVID was we were able to offer a pass for Wednesdays only at Shawnee Peak. And we had 16 residents who signed up and used that program. Um, and they reported to us that they were pretty much the only people on the mountain on Wednesdays and it was a huge success. It was a little further to travel but um, it was definitely worth it. And so those are the increases that you'll see in our line um, going forward. <clears throat> the two items that are increases in the budget other than uh, the ski program and the um, Halloween program is for our outlay or what formerly was our outlay. I think Derek can explain this a little bit, but when we actually met with our um, when we met with our new finance director, we changed our line to maintenance and equipment. We were bothered as you were with the outlay quote unquote account. Um, so we've changed that over to call it maintenance and equipment. And this is the one item <clears throat> that we're asking to purchase this year. This is an aerator. What it does is go is into the soil and takes out one inch plugs and air puts air into the ground and makes for better grass. We have had an aerator that we've owned since 2000 and we acquired it from Bowdoin College. At that time, it was built in 1957. We rebuilt it in 2000 and have used it for 20 years. It's been very successful, but it's at a point where the um, spoons that it has that go into the ground and <clears throat> the tires in it are, are really, um, we can't replace them. They're outdated, so to speak. Um, so technology has really improved since then. Um, that item would be much more expensive um, prior, but now we'd be able to pick something like this up for about 4,000, 4,500. 
um, at the most. And so that's the one item. I didn't put it in capital. We put it as an outlay because we felt it was a general maintenance item. And that is the one huge um, or one big expense um, that we have in our budget for the season. You can see the reflection of expenses from the ski program <clears throat> as revenue in the, uh, as this is projected revenues for next year. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the way that our budget works is the program lines, which are, you see in front of you are in my budget as well. And what we make, we have to bring in, we, we try to wash, try to make it equal so that all of the revenue we raise takes care of all the program expenses that we place. And that is my uh, report. Other than this, we do have a request um, for a pickup truck in the budget. We put aside monies last year. I don't have a slide for that. Um, we did put aside money for last year and we have the remaining amount in the capital budget this year. And uh, we'll be talking about that capital expense tonight uh, in a little while after Susan speaks. Pam, I got a couple. Okay. Um, with the Air at Cal Ripken League now doing their own intake and such, shouldn't we adjust our baseball well, Derek, as well as our expense? Yeah, Derek and I talked about that. I'm not sure how well that's going to go. I'm not sure there, that it will go smoothly completely without certain leadership. So if we don't spend it, we're not going to um, – bring in revenue from it. So it kind of is a wash. So I would, I, but I would surely understand if you wanted to go that route instead. Yeah. I mean, we gotta, we gotta make a decision one way or the other. Um, in my, in my opinion is once we put it in as an expense, whether that revenue comes or not, the people are taxed on it. So that's something we got to figure out and okay. maybe you could be, even if you just give us the number what it is and we got to figure that out um and i know this is for a year from now but we're talking 40 to 60 kids at 55 dollars a whack it's a it's a number yep yep um and the last thing probably more for derek shouldn't cable studio maintenance end up going over to central services or somewhere else and not the rec department. Yeah, that, that's, that's not a problem. We can move that right over. Okay. The, only, question? the yeah. only question I would have on that is because I'm the person who kind of spends that money or, or is authorized would just be make, making sure that if it's in that line that I'm, I'm able to, uh, process on it because sometimes those are some of those categories I don't have access to for processing on expenses so that would be just working it out with Kathy yeah I just no, I reality, understand. it's it's not it shouldn't be a we're not looking for it to be a recreation function forever and the quicker we break this away and do something in my opinion the better any other questions of Pam? Seeing nothing. Pam, you are clear. Thank you. Hey, Have Dawn, a good I night. Had a question. Oh, Dave? well, sorry. I didn't see your yellow hand up. <laughs> no worries. Um, it's actually uh, not so much. Um, I had one question, Pam, about that $2,000 ski program, but you answered it for me. So I'm all set there. This is more of a general comment, I think, for everything um, so far that I've observed thus far with the overlay category. And I know that, you know, this is obviously my second budget, and you guys have been through a number of more budgets than I have. So that term has some specific history with some folks, I think, and Derek clearly made an effort this year to get rid of it. Um, but I guess my one, not concern, but just uh, comment would be that going forward, I've noticed a lot of the folks have basically made or noted, and I'm sorry to call you out on this, Pam, it's not just you. Um, uh, basically said, you know, we've moved 
outlay to equipment and maintenance, which is fine as long as that outlay money is specifically used for equipment and maintenance. Um, and I have no reason to suspect it wouldn't be, but I think the, the, the fundamental issue wasn't necessarily that we had an outlay category. It was that we didn't know what that funding and outlay was being used for. And so if, if, if it is indeed being used for vehicle maintenance and equipment, that's great. Uh, but if it's not, I just want to see it split up. I'm not saying take it off at all or take it out of the budget. Just split it up into the different categories where it's being used. Yeah, and Matt, what we, decided, what we decided to talk to the department heads is that we looked into that outlay and what they've historically used that money for. And we just appropriate it into a, a lines that would identify that expense. And historically, that is what we've always used the outlay for is, you know, a lawnmower or something that needs repairs. If we don't really have a budget line for it. And that was where it would come out of. Yeah, I get it. And I appreciate that. I didn't mean to just call it out just now. Oh, no, that's fine. Were, there are several people before you have done that too, but I just wanted to make the differentiation between what I think the board was asking for last year versus um, just moving it to a different line item. But thank you. Good stuff. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is not a, a Pam specific question, Derek. This would go to you, and I don't expect you to know the answer off the top of your head, but. Uh, I'm seeing this in uh, Parks and Rec as well as the various other departments, but the uh, the FICA Medicare tax line item, that is running higher than just uh, FICA and Medicare tax. Uh, do you know what else is in that line item other than the FICA and Medicare? Derek, can I speak to my budget? Pat, yes, I think... Yeah, Pat, I think the one reason that ours looks a little askew is that you don't see the part-time staff that we fund through programs that we have to pay FICA for. In all of our program lines, you know, um, soccer referees, basketball referees, timekeepers, those kids that we hire from the community, we still have to pay FICA and, and those taxes on. So Pam... Um, those, those kids, that doesn't flow through the uh, part-time payroll line? No, that's, it that's comes okay. out of the actual... Did you say something just now? It, it actually, um, they're paid out of the program line. They're, they're a program expense. Okay. So, Kathy, I didn't realize that you were right there. So, like, I do see it, like, over in Public Works as well. So, what is that? No, it is just FICA and Medicare. There's, there's nothing else in there. So FICA and Medicare, the employer side of it is the 6.2 for Social Security and then the 1.45 for Medicare. Yeah. And then so just a simple equation, you know, just uh, multiplying the 765 times the full time plus part time payroll. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, that, you know, we're arriving, I'm arriving at different figures. So like with the uh, the public works. If I take the full time, part time, and overtime payroll, multiply that by the seven six five, I'm at about forty eight thousand six, or about forty eight thousand seven hundred versus the budgeted fifty one thousand or fifty two thousand hmm. almost. Well, I can certainly look at that. It uh, it's not jumping out at me why it wouldn't be in public works. Um, and it is in the other uh, various other departments as well. And it's not huge, but, you know, if you're talking a few thousand here and a couple thousand there across the various departments, but it's, there's, there's definitely something more going on there. Okay. I can, I, I can look at that and I'll send out an email tomorrow then. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Anything further folks? Seeing nothing. And last check. Thank you, Pam. Next up, library. Susan, all you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see everybody, even though we're not in the same room. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the library has been uh, not as busy as usual, but pretty busy and getting busier as, as the COVID situation changes. Basically, last March, our COVID realities um, have, have became a real issue. 
Um, the, and as you may have seen from the backup documentation, our theme this year for the annual uh, report was the method may change, but the mission remains the same. So some of the changes that that happened over uh, the you know from March till now, we've uh, we changed the our hours that were open in um, we were closed completely in March, uh, April, and until the end of May, and then in June we were open for curbside service, and from July on we've been open uh, for winter hours. Um, and that basically takes off the last two hours in the evenings uh, for, for our staff and for the open hours of the building. Um, <clears throat> our physical sp space constraints have changed. Um, we are very fortunate because we have a building that makes it uh, a little bit easier uh, to uh, socially distance or physically distance um, people in the building. So, so that has been very um, uh, a plus for us as opposed to other libraries in the area. Our staff jobs, tasks, and priorities have absolutely changed since uh, COVID. We're doing a lot more online work. We're doing a lot more concierge, what I refer to as concierge um, service. You know, somebody will call and want, you know, uh, a sort of a curated collection. Families will call the children's librarian. Um, they want, they're doing a, a homeschooling activity or an activity in regular school on such and such a, you know, owls, or, you know, can, can you give us some particular um, uh, um, uh, uh, books and materials on that? And so that, that has been happening. We have also been um, doing programming and activities. I think you may have seen in the summertime, we had a story walk outside in the outside the building. People would come, we were doing some activities outdoors. Um, and, but mostly what we're doing this year is grab and go. So there, so there are um, little bags that have activities for kids, for teens and for adults that they can come and take. Um, and again, those are all funded through the Friends of the Thompson Public Library. Uh, we've also had a partnership with CREA for some of the ones in, in the STEM areas uh, with the kids. So that's, that's been going on. And then our patrons borrowing needs have changed. Um, um, as, as more people are home, more people are on screens um, and not able to get the kinds of materials they're used to. Um, we have increased the number of databases we offer. Um, we've increased the amount of money that we've spent in our cloud library, um, um, eBooks and audio books. And we've, um, and we've been you know, working more uh, with the state of Maine and the other consortium members in beefing up their collections as well. Next slide. So last year, um, or this, this fiscal year, fiscal 21, our budget is $775,726. In fiscal 22, we are asking for a reduction to, of $26,000 to 749,598. This budget maintains the 85%, 15% agreement between the town and the library. And I know what you're all thinking next, and Derek, you can move it on there. How is she doing that? How are we gonna do that? Well, there has been a decrease in personnel and benefits, and that's been with regard to the changes in the staff. As you may remember, last year I had two staff members retire, um, and so we have been, you know, reworking our as as we did all last year, <clears throat> reorganized our tasks, looked at our job descriptions, moved some items, you know, to one staff member or another. Advertising, uh, our contract has um, increased uh, significantly in the past because of the lower, lower costs that we have been getting for the last three years. So that's increased $1,000 in our budget this year. Um, dues is uh, $625 for the main municipal association membership, which we need to have in order to be a part of the, um, the health trust. 
Um, we have some supply increases for COVID, basically COVID items, um, a little bit, you know, the cleaning supplies, the, um, you know, things that we have to set up, uh, areas that we have to scrub down and also um, to barricade different areas, et cetera. Uh, our library materials line is increasing by four thousand nine hundred dollars, um, and what it is also doing is is being reallocated to a certain degree. We have needed uh, more for online content, as as I mentioned, uh, people are taking out their e and audio books. Uh, we have started a um, Scholastic Book Flicks database which um, is for children and it's a read to me or read alone um, uh, database and you can read it on your iPhone or your iPad or whatever and your tablet and it pairs fiction and nonfiction books for kids who are learning to read and it also um, it, it has some activities it's it's pretty pretty cool stuff and it's really strong um, um, uh, materials that that will really assist kids in in their reading stuff. Um, we are also in the process of uh, beginning a new uh, cloud library product called Cloud Library Newsstand, which is going to provide e-magazines. Uh, many other um, libraries have a product called Flipster, and I'm sure you might have seen it, but it, um, it, it, it's a multi-use platform where you can basically read all your mag all the magazines you want on your tablet or your or your laptop or your you know phone. Um, and it is um, a significant um, improvement in, I think, in service. And it will allow us to no longer uh, have as many um, print subscriptions. So that's sort of what's going on with library materials. We reviewed the last three years of our utilities usage, and we are decreasing those lines by $4,500 and discuss that with, um, with uh, Kathy and Mark and, um, and Derek. Um, and then the insurance is an increase of $800, which is for contract changes. Um, and that's where, where we are. Kim, did you want to? Here we go, Kim, yep. There, I just took myself off mute. So I have a question. Um, thanks very much for covering this and in the advertising, you know, you said you had an increase of $1,000. This is my first year and I just want to understand what does the library do for advertising? We have a, um, we have a, a monthly page, full page in the Topsom Crier. Uh, the Topsom Crier is a, a business supporter. So um, we receive an, a significant discount um, on having a full page in the crier. It is one of the ways that we advertise what our programs are, what's going on in the library. And we have found in doing research with our, our public and our patrons, particularly our, um, our older patrons, that the crier is the art, is the place where people look for things in Topsom. And um, so the thousand dollar increase is, um, on your end, but it is also a thousand dollar increase on our end. So we're we are asking you to come up with a thousand dollars. We are also coming up um, because again, we have um, we provide some of the the monies for our budget as well. So okay, thanks for the clarification. Sure, Ruth. Yeah, uh, Susan, um, did you get any of the federal money because of COVID? Did the library? Some libraries did get some money. No. Most, most of the money that came um, through for federal money uh, for, for public libraries went to the state library and the okay. state um, added some additional PPE uh, to out and, and distributed it to the libraries. They also provided um, uh, a subscription to the Zoom uh, platform for many of the libraries that couldn't afford it and at a, at a reduced rate and that kind of thing. So yes, that, 
that federal money went through there. Because Topsum is a 501c3 organization, so we are a not-for-profit organization, we did apply for and receive um, a payroll protection, uh, our payroll, yeah, payroll protection act um, PPP loan. So, okay. yep, that's what I was wondering. And how much was that, Susan? One hundred eight thousand know? dollars. Okay, and uh, so there was no extra grants or endowments this year, right? Uh, we had a thirty-eight thousand. Um, grant from the American Library Association in Google for the Libraries Build Business program that we've been doing. Um, we've done our regular fundraising. Um, last year, we were down a little bit, not significantly. I'm just looking right now um, about uh, uh, 47,000 last year is what we, what we ultimately um, brought in for our annual appeal and that kind of thing. Um, and last year's grant was pretty much just, oh, we also got a bicentennial grant last year. Uh, that was a $500 grant through um, the state. Um, yeah. Well, um, just having said that, uh, it's that 38,000, was that part of the 15% that the library had to contribute? No. To reduce cost. I, I'm just curious. The 38, what happens with, uh, with the American Library Association Google Grant, it is for a specific project in our program. So we get the money and we spend it. So it's it's not, it, it doesn't add okay. anything to our coffers. It is, it is earmarked for particular things. And the 108,000 of the PPE was all spent for that for yes. payroll. And it was, and, oh, it oh, was yeah. we uh, it's we had payroll and um, I, uh, the finance department um, of the town billed us for the amounts and we uh, we paid for them. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Susan. Hi. Uh, this this ties with the budget, but it uh, begins to fall outside a little bit potentially. So I'll, I'll take my lashings from David Douglas as necessary. But uh, with the schools and the state that they are right now, with the reduced uh, student footprint physically, have you guys taken up any additional outreach to the schools to try to draw the kids to the library? Yes, we've done some significant outreach. Um, Mariah Sewell, our adult, our children's services librarian, has been a frequent guest at, in individual classrooms, um, particularly at Woodside and Williams Cone. Um, we have uh, we have really expanded our website and our um, online offerings. We have a YouTube channel. Um, we've done programming through there. The teachers have been um, have been contacting not only uh, Mariah uh, but um, Cindy Byrne, our uh, adult uh, young adult services librarian, and, and some of the um, some of the adults have been have been working with our um, our adult services librarian Emma as well. So we've been um, interfacing a lot with the school, um, and we've been facilitating. Uh, the return of some materials for them and, and trying to get some items in for, you know, for the school libraries and that they can't um, handle on their own. So. so your response comes as no surprise at all. You guys do a great job over there, my experience. Uh, and so to tie it to the budget to reduce the lashings that I may receive, uh, do you guys need anything, you know, just with our schools not operating at the capacity that they were, you know, is there anything that you need? You know, we, the more money, the, <laughs> we always need stuff, but right now um, I, I think this is a responsible budget um, to ask the town for at this time. Um, you know, we have been fortunate to have really good support from both the town and the community individuals in the community. Um, and, you know, we, we are, we are like everybody else following the CDC guidelines. Um, and so we, you know, we're open as much as we can be. And um, just as, 
you know, and a point of fact is that we are open more than um, the libraries in our area. We, none of the libraries in the area, Curtis Memorial Library, Patent Free Library, uh, Freeport, Yarmouth, none of those libraries are open for browsing. We have half hour browsing. And that is not only a testament to, um, to the staff that's willing to you know, go out there and, and work with the public in a, you know, kind of scary situation. But it's also because of the well-designed well designed building that we're able to do that. So thank you for your kind words. No, and that's, uh, I'll just, this will be my parting words, but, uh, you know, you, you discounted yourself there because I am aware of some of what's taking place at the local library. So clearly, you know, some of the decision-making from your seat is what's allowing this to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have, good, I have a great board too, so. Pat, your lashings will come because you failed to take advantage of an opportunity to attack the school board for failing to educate our kids in this year. <laughs> that, that's not really appropriate for this conversation, but I, I would be happy to opine on some of that, Dave. Uh, if, if the schools were operating the way that Susan is, I think our children would be much better off. Matt, you are next. Thanks, Dave. Um, Susan, great presentation. I also had a similar question what Kim had brought up um, regarding the advertising contract. I think the way, this is probably just the way you described it, but you had said because the first three years were so cheap, the, this year was more expensive. That kind of sounds like a pyramid mortgage to me. Yeah, like, no, there... essentially what has happened is that um, we, we have been very fortunate to work with Charlie Crosby at the Crier and Keith Spiro, who's a, the photographer that works with him. And, you know, he has tried very hard to keep the costs down for us um, so that we can advertise in the Crier and make sure that the library's programs are there. Um, he, he last year told me, he said, I don't know how much longer I can keep your, your um, costs at this level. And I, okay. you know, I shared that information with the board and I said, look, you know, I, he has been doing this for, you know, three to five years, keeping things relatively stable. You know, when, he, when his costs are up, we really have to, um, you know, figure out how to how to handle that so sure. the this year was a two thousand dollar increase we're taking a thousand dollars of the hit and we're asking the town to take the other hand thousand dollars and you know be, given the fact that we are asking for a you know lower um budget you know this year we felt it wouldn't it wouldn't be over the top so I'm concerned about the amount. It just sounded like a pretty bad contract uh, in terms of. It's really bad kids. for him. If you want the okay. truth, he's a really <laughs> nice guy. And, and I talk mm. people down to almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. One other uh, last question. You had reduced the periodicals newspaper line item by about a grand. Um, mm -hmm. What are we, uh, what are you axing? Dare I ask? Uh, most of our uh, of our periodicals, uh, most of our popular magazines, we're going to put that money into the the uh, cloud library, um, the e newsstand. Instead, one of the things that there is some concern about is the handling of lots of different um, uh, materials. You know, we, we, you can circulate. Uh, um, glossy magazines. And there was some concern, particularly in the beginning um, of the pandemic, about whether the glossy magazines held on to bacteria, or I'm sorry, virus longer than other things. Um, the, the verdict is, is, is still in the process of being, you know, researched at this point. But um, our sense is that more people would have um, the ability to see our collection of magazines because it's a simultaneously a simultaneous subscription. So everybody on this call could be reading the same page of the same magazine at the same time. Um, and that was what our choice was. So we're keeping newspapers. 
Uh, we're keeping the consumer reports. We're keeping um, the 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 you know Portland the 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 main related um, periodicals. But pretty much, you know, if it's People Magazine, it's going to go to uh, to the uh, newsstand. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill. Uh, my question is, are we, are we done with this presentation or, or are we done with the slides? Because I don't want to ask a question that, ask a question that's going to be answered in the slides. No, no this is it. Are, that was it. Okay. Okay. Then my, my question is the bequeathment you received a year or two or three ago, what is that yeah. money going towards? Right now it's in the Maine Community Foundation. Um, the board has earmarked some of that for um, for some of the building needs that we may be looking at down the road. We have a long range plan. Um, as, as you know, it's on the website. And one of the things that we're looking at is how are we gonna handle our, our space here um, as time goes on. And um, so some of that is being set aside for, um, you know, changing out staff desk, um, you know, getting new computers, uh, those kinds of, you know, uh, pieces of equipment um, and any kind of construction that might, you know, might be considered at this point. Um, $20,000 of, the, of the, the bequest is going to the town annually. Um, this is the, the 20, fiscal 22 will be the third year that we're doing that um, to uh, pay for the openings on Mondays to see how that's going and figure out, you know, how that, um, how, you know, to, to pay for that so that we can give it a try. Um, so far, it's been pretty successful. Um, and again, that's, that's going directly to the, you know, to the, to the town through service. Okay, so you're using some of it that would normally be funded by um, uh, through taxation. Is this, do I understand that correctly? Or 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 uh, our own uh, fundraising. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, the, I think the the general consensus is that you know that we are not trying to build up a huge, you know, war chest. We need that we were given this money to use for the public library and that's what we intend to do with it so right so so in that in that regard there was no real restrictions this is only no. just used by the library nope it was only restrictions um the only restriction was that it it should be it should be used for the community okay so would it be correct for me to say that some of this money is is being used to um uh, help the uh, tax lessen ever so slightly the rate that the taxpayers pay I would say with the twenty thousand um, dollars, you know, a year. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Susan. Yep. No problem. Ruth. Yeah. Just briefly, Susan. I I forgot to say. Um, I think it's been very difficult times, as it has for every all departments at the town of Topsom and other towns. And I do think that the resources of the library at this time is needed for the children since the schools aren't open full time and things like that. So I thank you for that because the kids have to have access to this stuff. And I think you're doing a good job with that. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I don't see any other hands. So I'm gonna go now, Susan. Two questions. And one of them, I don't know where, why I have this question. But the first one, your full-time payroll is the highest percentage of increase in the town outside of departments that have had staffing increases. It, what, can you break out a little bit more on your full-time payroll changes, please? Two of our full-time members are, um, I think, are going up for the, with the five, the, the five-year longevity bonus. Okay. And then large loss in part-time, just people, just you changed your needs? Reti retirements last year. And okay. we, so the retirements, we, we rearranged people's schedules 
Um, one of the things that, that public libraries live on is part-time help. So um, what we try, what we have, we, we have now five full-time and then another four FTE of part-time. So they're sort of, con you know, consolidating a little bit more. Okay. And the last one I cannot find anywhere, but somewhere in this budget, I believe I read it, it's the $20,000 Monday payment, right? that comes out of the bequeath. Right. I believe somewhere, maybe it's Derek. What's the, how does that work? Because when we when that was in this budget, which I can now not put my hands on it, mm -hmm. there was a zero next to it, like it hadn't been paid. Is it a lump sum being paid or we uh, so, it weekly? Yeah, so we, we pay their uh, wages and benefits. And uh, as far as that agreement for the next three years would be that pilot to see how Mondays are working. Um, annually, and I think we divide into quarters, they pay us $5,000 a quarter, $20,000 annually. You'll see that $20,000 line in revenue um, under finance treasure in the revenue section. Yep, that's why I couldn't put my hand on it because I wasn't looking under finance treasure. Okay. We're good for it. No, well, I know, <laughs> well, it just says the 2002, as of December 31st, there hasn't been a payment. No, I Since know we, we had, we, yeah, we, it, it will be allocated and it will go, we will get out there. Okay. So we, so this is as of December 31st and if we're doing this quarterly, we ha still haven't made a payment as we're two thirds of the way through the third quarter. Well, it, you know, we've had a lot of transition in our finance um, department. And so one of the things that I think has probably gotten lost in the shuffle is that invoice, I will in, in, uh, tell you for sure that it will be paid by the end of this month. That's February. Okay. Okay. That's all I had. Anyone else? I'm looking around, any other hands? Yeah, so Susan, you realize that the end of February is really tomorrow if you look at business days. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I, I, and I knew somebody was going to say that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. I don't see anyone else rushing up, Susan. I think you are free and clear. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, before we jump to the next ones, I want to go back to Kathy. She sent me a note and she had a little bit more of an explanation for the FICA question in the medical tax. Kathy, do you want to come up and uh, cover that? All right, maybe she's, oh, there we, there we go. No, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it took me. My little pad wasn't working. Um, the insurance buyout that we put in other benefits is subject to uh, FICA and Medicare, but it's not in the salary line. So you can't do a straight um, arithmetical computation in order to get the FICA to come out correctly. And that's my answer. Pat, thank you. Answer. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kathy. I appreciate you looking into it. Oh, you're welcome. All right. I've got to flip back here. I think the next, the rest of the stuff, Derek, how are you covering, are you covering capital and the, the, the rest? Yeah, I'll cover capital. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is Derek speaking. Sorry, I'm on that video. I just got a lot of screens up right now. Um, so most of the departments went over their uh, capital requests, but I'll highlight a few that uh, we haven't covered. Uh, the first one being capital replacement. It was back in fiscal year 19 that the board decided uh, with their former town manager to, uh, to uh, fund this account for those capital items that frankly just come about and you don't plan to have them happen. Usually something pretty critical or something that frankly you just wasn't planned for. Um, interesting enough, uh, there was a big uh, discussion on that year because that was my first year here on exactly where is this money going should be appropriated towards a certain system, a certain building, certain infrastructure. Uh, and it basically came out where it was just funded. Um, 
But the good thing is about that being funded, uh, soon afterwards, we came up with a $150,000 bill to replace the rotting trim and fascia on the municipal complex buildings. So that was somewhat of a godsend that that, that was funded and some other capital replacement uh, things that we needed to have happen. Uh, without that money, we probably would have gone to a town meeting. And again, it still has to be approved through the Board of Selectmen for us to spend it. Um, last year, uh, we had uh, this, current fiscal, this current fiscal year, uh, we budgeted for $150,000 um, and our actuals right now are 75,000. That was for the second half of the uh, fascia and trim project. This year we're requesting 175 uh, because there's quite a few things out there that potentially could fail. Um, and also with this, we're looking to roll this line over year after year. So we won't have to budget as much, but it would cover a critical failure in our infrastructure. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of some of, some of the things that can happen. Our generator was uh, over at the public safety building. Uh, when installed, has not been replaced. Uh, no real major repairs on it right now, but uh, that's clearly over $100,000 to $150,000 item that would have to be uh, replaced uh, if it failed. Also coming up with the next three to five years, uh, due to the, I think, uh, the new environmental standards, we are gonna to have to switch our compressor and our coils on our HVAC system on top of the roof over there because of the change in gas that's gonna be required. Uh, that potential project could be $100,000. Um, it's not gonna fail necessarily, but at least we'll have that money in the account if we don't uh, have it in a capital program during the year we actually have to replace it. Parking areas in the municipal lots uh, would be covered under this. Any flooring that needs to be replaced in any of our facilities. The garage bay flooring over at the fire station is a project that frankly, we don't have any estimates on right now. Uh, that's due to be replaced is something that could come from this line. Uh, solid waste facility, we have metal doors on our, on our uh, where you dump the trash that are failing. We're looking into it right now. We frankly can't get any estimates at this point to, uh, to get for, for replacements. So uh, we're also prepping just in the event that can be repaired um, that that's something that we could probably put in capital maintenance, which I'll go over here shortly. Um, we have uh, mortar repairs that need to be done on our, on our uh, town hall facility on the bottom. Uh, that, that's something that this would come from. Uh, lights, uh, TPL door replacements that we've talked about last year that we're looking at right now. Uh, estimates are high, but we're seeing what we can do. Um, this is an account that it come from, but most importantly, it's an account that we have in the event we have a critical failure in any of our systems that would uh, significantly impact our operations or infrastructure. So we're asking for 175,000 this year, an increase of 25 from last year. And if we don't, we're gonna spend it. If we have to spend it, we'll spend it as, as necessary. And a lot of this goes into what we talked about when we did our first presentation on the first night. The priorities that we looked at here was anything that's legally required doesn't really apply here but public works, public safety, and our infrastructure were the top three items that, that we looked at going into this, this capital uh, program department. Uh, next item, office equipment. Um, this was termed office equipment. Uh, when I got here uh, this year, we decided to change that name to IT, tech, and comms replacements um, because I, office equipment is, that term is used in central services and other areas. We didn't want that to be anything in the office equipment. It's gotta be specifically geared, I believe, to these items. Uh, we, ha we have budgeted this for $30,000. And what the majority of the increase is in preparation uh, for our computers, comms, and, and any sort of technical equipment that goes down. Uh, also considered here is our inventory report for our IT hardware, for our computers and laptops that are due for this next year. It doesn't mean we're gonna replace it just to replace it, but if it goes down, we've got the money to replace it. Um, and that in itself is about $30,000. Um, next item, uh, paving. Uh, Dennis covered this uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, we're increasing that $300,000. Uh, and we gave the reasons why, uh, of course, this is important to the town as well as keeping our roads uh, in great shape and, and condition so we don't have any major repairs later on and try to prolong that as much as possible. 
Uh, Dennis also went over the plow truck uh, to replace plow truck number 35, uh, and that's for 190. Uh, this truck, uh, just as a reminder, was cut from the budget last year, and unfortunately, due to maintenance costs, we need to put this back on uh, to get it replaced. And of course, Dennis talked about the forklift, and Chief Hagen uh, talked about the police cruiser and the in-car camera systems. Uh, cardiac monitors were also replaced. Now, um, uh, Chief is uh, is here tonight. In the event that you would like to ask more questions, the follow up and Parks and Rec. Uh, Pam talked about it tonight a bit. Uh, the maintenance and plow truck. Uh, she had gone out and got estimates uh, fairly recently for about fifty thousand uh, dollars, and that would include a, a plow. Uh, last year, we budgeted fifteen thousand. This is something that was programmed. Uh, be, before we came up with the budget anyways. Uh, so we had to make up the difference of $35,000. Now the current parks and rec truck that we're replacing, uh, instead of getting another vehicle for solid waste, it would suit the purpose of, of uh, for solid waste. So uh, we'd basically be taking uh, the, the dilapidated truck that Ed Karen seems to still be able to drive and we'll give him this, this truck that we're replacing and it should last him a few years. And uh, we're going to make some small repairs on it so we can also put a plow on it and uh, make sure that the dump is working. Uh, and our assessing evaluation reserve, uh, for the past few years, uh, the town has been appropriating $15,000 going back, I think, uh, quite a few years, actually, uh, 10 years or so, Dave, I think. But um, we're due for a reval. Uh, at some point, especially probably within the next year or two for a commercial evaluation because the market has changed so much. Uh, Justin's done a great job with, with residential uh, and private properties, but uh, this is a way so we don't get hit with a huge bill uh, coming up. And I think right now we have approximately $98,000 in that account. And this will add another 15. Typically revals are anywhere between 300 and $400,000 to, uh, to conduct one. And lastly, the uh, Elm Street culvert replacement uh, we talked about as well. So we'd have to raise $425,000 for that for a $675,000 project. Uh, the one thing that we uh, cut out this year that was, was kind of going for years, the same as the uh, assessing and evaluation is the, uh, the commercial appraisal uh, for $1,500. And uh, we have enough money in that account so we don't have to fund it anymore until we believe the rates are gonna go up on that. And uh, that's it for capital. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or try to. Derek, I got a line of them. Um, I don't know how I feel with the, and this will be part of the deliberations, I think, um, how I feel on what's formulated going into the replacement line. I understand things about failure and such. Um, so this is more of a general comment and I don't know where I'm going to come down, but when we start talking about projects of, um, exit door shelters, floor resurfacings, I think that's starting to come outside of what the expectation was. It was there for emergencies. That's just a general comment. I've got to think about it. You know, maybe it's, but where we go with it. Um, is Dennis on tonight? No, he's not. No. Can you ask him the possibility, you know, several years ago, we thought we were, we bought a skid steer with the idea that we thought it was going to be able to, um, handle some of the sidewalks for snow removal and such. And that wasn't the case. And then a year later, we bought a, a, uh, true sidewalk machine what are the possibilities that we could just simply buy forks for the skid steer, skid steer instead of a forklift to do the activities he's looking for, you know, lifting plows, list, lifting standards and such. I don't know the technicalities, how much weight they all lift, but it seems as though we, I, I really want to, we made a bad choice buying that skid steer. I really want to find some way, some uses for it. So if you could ask him if forks are, um, an option rather than a forklift. If, if I could interrupt, I think he actually did say that he had forks for that, but it wasn't safe um, logistically when you're when he's lifting something up in the air. He didn't feel it was safe, kind of moving okay. around. 
I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure because that was my thought too, originally. Okay. But I'm pretty sure no, they have forks. He he also mentioned that uh, using the skid steer indoors with the exhaust versus okay. the forklift, which I assume is propane based, which doesn't have the exhaust. That was the other thing that he brought up. Yeah, I, I do recall him talking about propane base. Yep. All right, so maybe that answers that. Um, Chief, is Chris on? I'll get on cardiac monitors, Chief. Last year when we bought the new ambulance, we did we buy a new cardiac monitor with that truck? That is in this year's capital program, yes. Okay, so you said last night monitors are seven to 10 year replacement. If we do two right now and we get another one coming, we're going to be replacing all three of them within reality about a year, right? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, um, and I'll be honest, the one that I'm looking to buy with the um, capital this year might be a refurbished one um, because it's probably going to go back line as a spare. Well, so, and that leads to where I was wondering, you yeah. know, we talked about that third ambulance really is bailing us out right it's when we sure. have a truck down or something which we can move equipment on if we know a truck's going down um Correct. But i just worry if we're buying three monitors that have a span of seven to ten years of replacement <clears throat> ten years from now seven years from now we're replacing all three at the exact same time again and not knowing um that situation budgetarily ten years yeah no years. And, and my my plan long term dave is to replace two every time and we can send one back line as a refurbished or a spare or, um, cause that third truck is a spare. If one goes out of service, um, we can put that truck in line. So our plan for this capital budget was to try to buy a refurbished one. And we might be able to send one of these monitors back and get refurbished for this year's capital for that third ambulance. So going forward, we might only have to replace two for those two frontline trucks. Um, so and, before we get to our public hearing in April, would you have a better idea what we may be able to do in a different cost or before we yeah, wrap I the mean, budget up permanently? Yeah, either way, we still need to buy two for the two frontline trucks. Um, what I'm getting at is well, this year, I, I can probably buy a refurbished one for the backline rescue, that rescue three. Um, yep. And because I'm going to have to buy a lot of other equipment out of that capital line backboards, scoop stretchers, stair chairs, uh, IV pumps, drug boxes. So buying a refurbished one for that backline truck is the way we we're going to go. Um, but our two frontline ambulances that run, um, those were the monitors I was looking to replace. So going down the road, you can probably only have to replace those two front lines every time and uh, you can send one backline or send it out to get refurbished, um, that type of deal. So that 325 last year, my understanding was a monitor comes with it. That's part of that purchase. Yes. And yes. And we had, so uh, we had looked at refurbished ones as part of that because the ambulance itself is about 280. Um, yep. Stair chair is four or 5,000. IV pump is four or 5,000. You're at 290. A refurbished monitor is about 15. You're at 310. And then you got drug boxes, jump kits, all um, McGrath laryngoscopes. So that's where that 325 came from. All right. So cautionary tale, kind of the same thing with the PD cruisers. Let's make sure we price out. If we make that decision to do three and a quarter, what's the big deal to go to 335, 340 when we decide so we're not in this situation the following year? You know what I mean? Let's just make yeah. sure we afford it all in. Yeah. And we don't want to and sell ourselves shy just to try to get something passed, right? Maybe that might have been controversial. Yeah, and, and, and you know our, that that's one option. I gotta I gotta see what everything else costs to, to figure out where we are with the monitors, with the monitor for this new truck that's coming in. These ones are simply the in the CIP to be replaced this year. Uh, we bought these in 2014, so capital year 22 it makes them eight years old. Um, I went back and did some research. These monitors we have now replaced monitors that were bought in 2009. So the monitors previous to this, we only got five years out of. Um, these ones have done significantly better. They've, they've held up longer and they've done, I mean, we're on the eight year mark. So uh, that's what these two motors are for the frontline truck. And then the capital ambulance that we're buying this year, um, we possibly could get another new monitor, but you're right. 
eight years, 10 years down the road. Now we're replacing three. Um, so I want to, I want to refurbish the prices for that, the new one coming in. So. Okay. And then Derek, the revaluation, did you say that money we're only looking for the next revaluation is more of a commercial eval, right? For this 15, each time the 15. That's correct. That's what Justin's looking at right now. Uh, he's okay. he's going to get uh, estimates on how much that's going to be here shortly. All right. I don't know who is first, but I'm going to start whoever's top of my screen, Ruth. I see you, Gail. Okay. Oh, that's what I wanted to make sure. I didn't know if Gail was pushing the button at the top. Um, the, um, uh, I just have a statement, and I, I think the capital budget is the programs are good. The one thing I just have a hard time with caution, I just don't want to see anything overinflated uh, because it is money that we get from the taxpayers, it's borrowed money from them. And, but I, but I do want to see capital programs, but I just want to make that statement because that's how I feel about it. And we've done good so far in doing our planning ahead better than a few years ago. So, but I also want to make sure, and this is my opinion, that in any line, even if there's money left over, that money is spent in those lines and for those things that they aren't swapped in and out for other equipment or for anything. What the taxpayers vote for when they go to town meeting is what they see and what they know. So that's all I have to say. And I don't know if it makes sense, but I had to say it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to Gail so I don't lose track of her. Sorry, Bill and Matt. All right, I want to go back to the, excuse me, the capital replacement line item. I know this came on board just a few years ago. And again, like you mentioned, it was an emergency fund. And at that point in time, we had looked at a cap in terms of what we wanted to accumulate in that fund. Is that still out there? And if so, what is that cap? Uh, Gail, I'm not aware of any cap that was specifically handed to me. Um, I, did, I felt a little uncomfortable going this high. But again, I probably shouldn't have mentioned those other things because I was kind of looking at all of our capital. But it is fit, the, the generator sticks in the back of my mind the most if that went down. Um, I don't know how much a boiler would cost. I don't think we have any boilers that are, are in that, that critical condition at this point. Um, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to be covered in the event that that, that major piece of equipment went down. Gail, I do think, and I don't know the number off the top of my head, I do think it was a discussion of building up, getting to a point and having that number. And I don't remember that number. Um, so Derek, maybe if you could find out, you know, we're looking here on this budget, there's been 350 appropriated. And I know we've spent significant numbers out of this. Where are we at that? And you know, as we, if, if we do wanna start talking about a cap again, and get something in writing to find out where we're at and make that decision. Yeah, it's not a problem. Okay. Does that work, Gail? Yeah, and I think, the, if I recall, the, the number that was thrown out back at that point in time was 500,000. So, okay. yeah. So I'm going to go that back I, on mute. I was hoping for lower. <laughs> no, I was that. just saying that I think was what was thrown out. I'm not saying that's what we needed, but I think that was what was thrown out at that point in time. So, okay. Okay, I'm gone. Bye. Matt? Matt, you're on mute. It looked like an intense conversation you had. Uh, it was intense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I know we've talked about, um, I know this is brought up last year around budget time. We talked about a capital uh, replacement plan. And I've heard referenced a couple of times that there is an Excel spreadsheet out there somewhere that exists that was created a couple of years back um, to sort of get at some of this what I think this replacement account is really for. 
So I guess my question was, and I, I don't really have an issue with, with having that account around because I, I agree with, the, with you, Derek. I think it's important to have an emergency fund like that. Um, but I wonder if it's possible to maybe use some of that funding this year to do an honest to God capital expense or capital planning exercise for some of the town's resources. And I don't know if it would come out of that line item because it, obviously it's capital. Um, but I mean, you could look at something else, maybe bring in a consulting, uh, a consulting firm on to take a look at um, not the departments necessarily because I feel like they do a pretty good job of tracking their assets uh, and knowing when they're about to expire. Um, but just the buildings, maintenance, big things like that, the boilers you mentioned, uh, it might be good just to have a really solid list on hand so that way, when you have this line in the budget next year, you can just be like, hey, look, um, this is what we talked about. Uh, here's what our consulting firm came up with. Um, and this is what we're probably going to spend this money on this year. Yeah, Matt, this is part of the reason why we uh, we went with the PM agreements that we did that you funded last year. Um, yep. So the HVAC, uh, we've got an inventory list. We're still putting that together. They just started uh, about four or five months ago. And the... Uh, the roofing PM agreement, uh, they'll yep. come out in spring to do their first assessment. So once once we see that, we're, we're gonna be able to make some some good adjustments and be a little bit more uh, precise as far as our systems and what could go wrong. It was just a thought. My other thought, and this is very fleeting, um, along the lines of the forklift, Dave, uh, just, I mean, I've got a two ton engine lift in my garage that they can use, um, they can keep it on site. I'm just trying to look at ways that we might be able to limit some of these expenses. And I had some thoughts about that forklift as well. I love forklifts, especially the propane kind, but man, uh, that's a lot of money. Um, and it seems like for some of the tasks that Dennis had listed, um, it seems like there are other solutions that might not cost as much. Just a thought. That's all I got. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, for like the whole time I was listening to people talk, I forgot what I wanted to ask. And then Matt asked the question. Yeah, the 25 year capital improvement. Derek, I, did I ask you that a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in one of our phone conversations about what happens in that spreadsheet? I oh, just we, don't want to no, we, we, we have it. That, that's what this is all based off of this whole. This okay. Whole bunch. okay. And uh, I'm going to segue real briefly. But two or three years ago, this is, and David, you could probably just chime right in on this. Um, what were we supposed to be putting sidewalks in on four side field? And my question is, whatever happened to that? And did we, didn't, didn't we fund it or start to fund it? You know, it's, no, it since I've been in, out. It came in extremely high, Bill, more than we, the, the swag that they gave us was really, really low compared to where it came in. It's been a, it's been a topic, but it just hasn't been um, risen to a need that it, that it was. The, you know, we put the flashing signs at the crosswalks, but the cost of it really became prohibitive. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, okay, yeah. Sort of like, well, well, I'm glad to see we finally got the lights put in at the basketball court. In 2009, my first first year on the finance committee, we were talking about the lights, replacing the lights. So glad to see that's happening. All right, that's all I got. I am looking around for any hands on capital. All right, Derek, I see nothing. Next one, I think it's utilities maybe. Yeah, I'll go through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, so utilities. Uh, I spoke with Dennis at length for street lights, traffic signals, and maintenance. Uh, we decrease those based on actuals and, and where we're going with those two items. Uh, his recommendations are is what you see on paper right now, and I didn't disagree. The hydrant rentals, of course, is the big one, and I think most people are familiar because we briefed you last year, is due to the uh, Water District's new building, their debt service. Uh, it's coming to play this year and for next year. So just as predicted, uh, there's about a 16% increase in those rentals. Uh, and I confirmed it with um, somebody close to the board. And uh, we can expect probably a 20% increase next year. So expect that to happen. So that's big, basically our big expense, but uh, we were able to cut some money back on the other two items. 
Any questions? There, and I apologize for jumping you on this because you haven't even had a chance to talk to the board. Um, I know you had a conversation last week and maybe you didn't, maybe it didn't go off. Is there anything you can bring to us as far as our credits for the solar, uh, how that's all gonna work for us? Maybe you had a plan on when to bring, bring it to us, but, and I just sprung it on you. Yeah, we had a, we had a meeting with Nick Sampson, who uh, is a representative from, from Revision, met with Mark, myself, uh, I believe Kathy and John Shattuck. Um, so this next bill that comes up, we should see those credits reflected on the bill. Uh, Mark, if you're on, if you have anything else to add, uh, please do. But um, that's where we stand. We're just waiting for that bill to come in. Is that when we'll know exactly what the credits were worth? I'll stay on. Uh, so what happens is the credits are going to be generated as the power is generated. So what they've told us is to expect is that in the summer, it's going to look like we are uh, making a, a lot more money than they quoted to us. And then as the winter comes and it's not generating as much electricity, we're going to be drawing down on them more. Um, so we, Brandy sent me an email yesterday, said she thinks we, or appears we're now finally starting to get the credits. Um, so we, now that we've got them, we're going to you know, compare how all it, all it goes and things. Um, but it looks like we, uh, we're about to start getting them soon and we're about to start having our savings. Thank you. So that's something we may see, we can start seeing some changes uh, even in this budget before we go to our public hearing in April, I would think, right? Correct. Okay. Bill? Right. So uh, just uh, to comment on Derek's comment concerning uh, hydrant rentals. So basically the water district is, is double taxing the rate payers because they're, they're taxing us through a direct hike in water rates and they're taxing us through the town and our property taxes through an increase in hydrant rentals. Do I understand that correctly? Open to anyone who wants to care to answer. Steve, I hate to be to that spot, but the answer is better than anybody. I got it. Your rate increase is for the water you use at home. Mm -hmm. The rate increase on the hydrant rentals is for our fire protection. The water district has no, re no need for 20 inch mains to be sitting in the ground to deliver water to your home, to my home, to all of our homes, but to meet fire flows that are needed for the fire department when they operate um, at a scene, at a fire, they, they have to, we essentially rent these from them. They, they don't have the need for the infrastructure that we require due to um, fire protection. So you're, you're not being doubled, you're paying for each item that you're using. Right, but Dave, but, but the, the rate that we pay for water has gone up, has it not? Due to the up the up uh, building the new plant. It, yeah, it's expected to. They can't even go before the PUC until they show that they don't have enough money coming in. If you look at um, last year's, I'm trying to find it here on my screen. You look, you see, we had a we had a jump of in actual 2019, 2020 versus 2000, 2021. They expected that they were going to have a rate increase. So we had that built into our budget. Due to a season of drought and many, many people watering their lawns and overusing, they could not prove to the PUC that they had a need. So they couldn't even go ask for a rate increase. Although it looks like in our budget, because we were prepared for it, they expected it, it didn't happen. So now this year, they're still again, expecting that they're gonna to have to go to the PUC to pay this bill. Because they can't, they can't even just ask for a rate increase until their bottom line hits a extremely low number on coming in and whether it's gonna meet their bills or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, yeah, yeah to put this in context, yeah, we knew this was coming, what, late, at least three years ago. And now it's, you know, now the cows have come home, so to speak. Um, 
and I, you know, and not to drag this out, but I always expl- I used to explain this to people about these things. Like we rent the streetlights, we rent the hydrants, but people don't realize that. They just think, oh, we own it. It's like, no, we don't. We pay a fee. No, right. You know, we pay a fee and it usually goes up every year. So, but anyway, um, yeah. So sorry if I'm bringing up stuff, but, you know, I've been out of it for about 15 months. So I'm trying to think of things that just, you know, as they come to mind. I'm no, done. There's a, hope, there's a hope, Bill, just to answer for that too, is Streetlights is the same same thing. And we, you know, the 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 new committee and their name escapes me, the uh, energy, energy committee. Really? That's something they're looking at is what's the possibility of owning these street lights, having them converted to LEDs and save us some money? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think I saw that. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. that's being looked at and such. Right. And it's always it's the upfront cost that people can't stomach because, you know, as human nature are we as anyone, we want, um, you know, we want re- results now and we're either positive or negative. The negative is it's going to cost you a lot of money now, but 10 years from now, whether you realize it or not, you're going to be spending less. And that's the point you got to try to convince people. Right. So, uh, all right. No more questions. Pat? Hey, Dave, you just mentioned that the Energy Committee is looking at the, uh, the streetlight uh, rentals or the, the traffic, yeah, the streetlight rentals. Is somebody looking at the hydrant rentals as well? The, you know, a cost benefit analysis of uh, ownership versus rental? Nobody is. Um, initially in my head, I don't, it's not that we're owning the physical hydrant or we're looking to own that. It's the infrastructure to deliver the amount of water that we need should the chief pull up to a building tonight. My house at the greatest amount of times using four or five gallons of water a minute. Chief pulls up tonight, he's gonna need to flow one, 2000 gallons a minute. That infrastructure means that you must have much larger pipes in the ground and such. It's not just that physical unit that you're renting. You're also, it's the entire infrastructure. But this specific line item, is that just the hydrant rentals or is that the infrastructure built in there as well? That's all of it. Okay. We so put hydrant if, it's and infrastructure, hydrant. if it's infrastructure as well, you know, we're seeing a sharp increase here. We over the last couple of years, if it's infrastructure, once that's paid for, then really we should see a decrease in that line item. Well, it's ongoing. I mean, there's an okay. ongoing upkeep to it. Okay. And, and Pat, just as I said to you, you see the 177, 625 two years ago, right? Yep. We didn't. If we had a column there that showed actual expenses, it wouldn't yep. show the 262, 125 because they didn't ask for a rate increase. At the okay. time we passed the budget, we expected it, but I believe actual usage would come out somewhere around that 177 area. Okay. Okay. And it's just one of those things, you know, if the energy committee is doing it with the uh, the street lights, you know, just like uh you know, like Bill was just talking about, yes, uh, you know, scary upfront costs, but if over the course of 10 years, we're saving X number of dollars, mm-hmm. you know, as long as somebody's keeping an eye on it, good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how we'd own a water main, but. How you'd own a water pipe? Yeah, how we would own our own water pipes. You know, we, we don't pay for the water. Yep. Chief, Chief flows a million gallons of water tonight, putting out a fire. We're not getting a water bill for it. It's, we're just simply paying for that ability to, to, to use it. Okay, okay. Dave, how about this analogy? If, um, if fires didn't exist, residential fires or commercial fires didn't exist, the town would probably need three inch pipes. But since we live in a world where fires do exist, we need five inch pipes to make sure that we can put out fires at the farthest reaches of our community. I thought you explained pipes. it pretty well. Yeah. yeah it's, right. it's, yep. it's you know what I'm just I know what you're saying. Right. I know what you're saying, but you're right. It's exactly what it is. If if we didn't have that possibility, we we wouldn't survive off, you know, 10% of what we have in the infrastructure has. 
That was a good explanation. I kind of landed where Bill was coming from initially, but when you explain that, it's it makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you for that. Good stuff. Thanks, Derek. Any other questions on public utilities? Nothing. Derek, next one. Okay, uh, for insurance, Kathy, you might want to stand by uh, in the event that there's a lot of questions being asked. But um, the two items I'd like to highlight, because frankly, you know, we have some sort of leeway here a bit, is HRA replenishment. So when the town switched health care plans, I believe it was back in fiscal year 18, uh, the town assumed a very high utilization rate for the health reimbursement account. I think you budgeted for about $122,000 thereabouts. And over time, you were able to adjust to figure out, hey, what are we truly using? Um, up to this point, our utilization rate in town is about 35%. So that 67,350 is at 35% utilization. Now, in past years, what was happening is that account was getting rolled over to cover any reimbursement to that to HRA. Um, we have a bit of a reserve that we're gonna put back into the general fund this year. And so we're just gonna go strictly and fund the reimbursement rate that we're currently utilizing because we've had, we've had several years now where we're getting accurate numbers. So unless it changes, we'll know, but that'll be what we're gonna budget for is the utilization rate again in the mid thirties right now. And so the rest of the money is in account one more time, we'll go back to the general fund after this year. Uh, the next line is payroll adjustment, unfunded liability. So back in fiscal year 20, former town manager budgeted uh, with the board's consent about 3% for union negotiations, which was about 180, 941 is what he budgeted for. Um, with the, and I'll give you the background on this. With negotiations going on, we had quite a few vacancies here in town. So we never spent that money. That money has been sitting there. Uh, last year, uh, we funded $100,000, but when we funded that $100,000, we had no idea that we weren't gonna use all of it because we just closed the books this year on that, you know, the, the year that we budgeted that 180. Our, so that was the initial, let me let me back up here to be a little bit more clear. Initially it was for that, that union negotiation. We decided to change that because the one thing that we didn't have in town, which we budgeted for last year, was any fund that would fund our unfunded liability for compensated, well, compensated absences. Um, we funded that because when we did some research, when I took over as town manager, I realized if a couple of people left, that would have been upwards over $100,000 uh, that we have to pay out that frankly, we didn't have any money for. Uh, so the board uh, and the finance committee approved that $100,000. This year, we're requesting $50,000, okay? So there's a couple things at play here. As of June 30th, with our last audit, our compensated absences would be 216,000 and change. But that's assuming everybody in town would just get up and walk away and leave and we'd have to pay them out. Okay. So right now, in this line, we have approximately $250,000 um, that's available to us. 216,000 if 100% of our people left. We're asking for $50,000 in here, in this line, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we would have enough money to pay out if, if people if, if, there, if our top people here in town decided to retire next year. But also with this line, it would give you enough money going into uh, maybe outside of a little bit, depending on what the board decides for negotiations next year when we have to do contract negotiations. So you wouldn't have a large spike um, when it comes to, hey, we want this money, money set aside for the, for the negotiations coming up. So that's the story behind this line. And I'd like for there to be some discussion. 
Derek, when you say 216, 440, that's not every employee getting up and walking out. That's eligible employees leaving. Yes. 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 So that's that's employees that could retire and anything that we owe them as far as contractual payouts or and such. Right. And I can name two people right now. If they left, it's going to be upwards around $75,000 and they could leave at any point. Bill? Yeah. I mean, I could speak to this. My last year on, uh, on the county, with the county, um, they had this very same problem. They are a lot worse off than we were because they never funded it until, um, God, I forgot her name now. Who's the county administrator? Pam. Pam. Yes, Pam. And uh, yeah, until she uh, until she got a handle on it, and they had to start throwing a lot of money up for the very same reason. Um, and uh, go jumping backwards to the HRA replenishment. You know, uh, David knows about this because this was we're all. Uh, there, when this got negotiated, the thing about this, this HRA replacement, I already had a conversation with the finance committee and Derek about this, is that this really works well for the town because otherwise you're paying for insurance or that you don't need. So they went with a, a couple of years to see what the utilization rate would be. It turns out it's 35%. And that's what we that's what we funded because otherwise, consider if we weren't doing this way, just consider we would be spending thousands of dollars more per year for basically having people overinsured. So this HRI replenishment is a very good deal for the town and the taxpayer. And if you recall, Bill, in those negotiations, we were told that historically, anywhere they've done this and negotiated, it's about a thirty five percent utilization rate. And we found out now it took us a little longer and we spent a little bit more, but we found that to be exactly true. Yeah. Well, this is exactly going back to my comment, you know, in the beginning when we funded it, it was a hit, but now as the years go by and that's expensed, now we're actually why the number, maybe someone doesn't like to look at the number, but it's less than what we would be paying, but that would be showing up in the benefits line. So again, Something you know, we are paying, even though someone doesn't feel it, so to speak, for lack of a better term. Um, yes, this is a this is saving money for the taxpayer. That's all I got. Anyone else looking around? Derek's looking for conversation. Derek, you're probably more looking. You want conversation on the payroll and unfunded liability line, right? Dealing yeah. with where people. I, I do. I, I do because I, I think I think this way here we're covered. You're not going to have a large spike. We're keeping everything budgeted as is, and we don't expect 100 people. I mean, 100 percent of our eligible people to leave, anyways. I'm just basically. Right. I know we have enough to cover those people who are getting ready to retire, uh, who could retire, and and you'd have a, a good amount of money going in without anybody knowing what that is for negotiation. Ruth. Um. I just, uh, I know we have to have money for people that retire. I just feel that's a little high and that's to go into next, to go into next year's negotiations. I, I just think that's a little high reserve myself. Well, what it is, I, is I don't have a figure. I don't have a figure. I haven't thought about it enough, but, and I understand what you're saying, Derek, but it looks like so many lines are, in case this happens, in case that happens, which we have to do good budget and good planning ahead, but how much? This year it's $50,000, Ruth. It's not that 216,440. That's, that's the amount that if the eligible employees left, that's what we're on the hook for. I understand year, that. Yeah. Okay, this year they're just asking for 50,000. I understand and a portion that. Of it's up to that. Okay. And that make that two hundred two hundred and sixty six thousand four hundred and forty dollars. Right. Yeah. Bill. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll just add that. Um, uh, in in uh, to answer sort of uh, with Ruth's comment, 
Um, we do these things. I think this type of funding for the future, as we have been doing, as this town's been doing for the last couple of years, we're feeling the benefits of it right now. Because when I first started serving this town back in 2009, there was too many instances where no money was set aside for anything. And we we're paying huge amounts because we have to come up with the money right away. Uh, to have, you know, we do it for, uh, you know, the reevaluation, we do it for the dam revaluations. We do it when we are buying more capital equipment. Again, going back to my previous comment of why that number right now is an ugly number, it's going to pay its benefits next year, the year after that, and the year after that. Um, this town 20 years ago, or whatever number, before my time, had a bad habit of underfunding things the way I understand it. I mean, $200,000 for roads, that's why we're spending $600,000 for roads now, because they did not get the attention. Um, it's ugly, yes. Um, we have a lot of people who have a tough time paying their taxes. Um, it's not lost on me now, even though I'm not in a decision-making role. Um, but again, these decisions we make today and the way we're making it are going to pay their dividends in the future. Thank you. Kim, go ahead and I'll get to you next, Neil. Okay. Thanks, Dave. So I'm just, I'm asking these questions because I want to understand that $216,000 number. Um, so is this a number that gets funded every year and at this point it's at the 266 or um, for those occasions when people retire. So that's my first question. The second question is what is the onus on the employee on uh, the length of notice they have to provide for retirement? That's just, it's just my curiosity to figure this out. So they, they, they can give us a two week notice. They, oh, really? Um, yeah. Generally speaking, I think most people give us you know, some time. Uh, I, there hasn't been too many retirements here, but we have a significant, I should say, say a, a relatively significant portion of our employees who have been here for quite a few years. And, and there's a good handful that are eligible to retire. Um, I can tell you if two, two people over at the police department decided to retire tomorrow, it's about $75,000. So there's not a negotiation with the contract because it is such a large amount of money to require them to give significant notice because it hits the budget so hard. There isn't any requirement for that. Okay. No, and, and these are these are the majority of these Kim have been negotiated through contracts. Yeah. Um, you know they negotiate how much sick time to, they can leave with and vacation sitting on the books and comp time and such. That, that, but there hasn't, you're right, maybe it's something to think about as we go next spring, we'll start negotiating again. Maybe it's, but the reality is at the end of the day, if someone had a life change and they gave 30 years, do you, uh, it'd be Derek doing it, so I wouldn't feel bad, but. Yeah, and I don't know what. Yeah. And I don't know what the answer is. I can only apply knowledge that I've had in the past where, you know, working for a big corporation, if you're thinking about retiring, you give them significant notice because there's a process that has got to be put into place to um, allow for that. And what's, what's the um, eligibility for retirement to be considered a retiree? Is it, is there like a 20 year it's different for the police and fire department. They're in 20, 25 years usually. Um, and, but the town employees, uh, you know, they, they have to become vested for one. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as retirement, it just pay out. Um, yeah, when they leave, whatever. Kathy, do you want to get into details on exactly what we pay out for? Sure. Um, the payout usually is for any kind of unused vacation. Um, the only sick time that we pay out for is the police department is it's stipulated in their contract. Um, we also might pay out for, uh, we allow people to, to do comp time instead of having overtime. 
Um, they can, uh, you know, bank it and then use it later. So there's all kinds of different elements and a lot of them are conditioned in the contracts. The 216 that you're looking at is a point in time type thing. It's not like we, we don't exhaust it every year. It's just people come into the system, people leave the system. And at June 30th, it was 216,440. So what we're trying to do is make sure we have, have that money there, but also um, in this case, I think Derek said that, that we're looking on renegotiating contracts also and you don't you really don't want to play your hand on what you're thinking that you that you're going to give or going to take and well that's all i really have to say so the 216 is the liability and it's unfunded it's exactly okay well actually now it's it's we're working our way towards getting it a, a certain point to be funded so that we're not caught unawares and having to take a hit when people do retire. So we have, we have a bit of a cushion so that, we can, so that we can pay out what's due to people when they retire. Well, thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. Gail, sorry, Kim, were you done? Okay. Okay, yep, go ahead, Gail. Okay, I, I just want to clarify a few things. Uh, number one, I, I understand Kim's the notice, but would that really make any difference on what we would owe, whether you had a two week one, you'd still owe the same amount, right? Number two, in, if I'm looking at the numbers and if I'm reading the numbers correctly from the spreadsheet, we allocated 100,000 last year. So far we've spent 30 of that, leaving a 70 plus the 50 that we're budgeting this year would give us a hundred and thirty thousand dollar cushion at the end of the year, right? So we are not up at the two hundred and sixteen thousand, right? Yeah. So right now we're in in that line right now as it currently exists. We have about two hundred and fifty thousand in in there. So we're asking for an additional fifty. Okay. So I'm not seeing that when I'm looking at that. I'm seeing a hundred thousand from the budget from the twenty one. I'm seeing we spent thirty thousand. Okay, so yeah, Gail, I'm sorry. In the beginning, when we first funded this line, it was called insurance, and it was for it was for um, payroll adjustments. It had to do with uh, the negotiations, mm -hmm. of insurance. and at the time, they funded three percent of uh, what they thought they wanted was hey, keep it under three percent uh, for the negotiations for all three unions, uh, and that that came out to about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. So we get that 180 that still sits there, plus so the 70, is, 250. So where is that reflected then? If 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 I wanted to see the entire 216 thousand, where is that 180 thousand hidden right now? Well, I'm trying to look here. Um, if, if that's if I'm hearing you correctly, and maybe okay, because it wasn't that. spent. It wasn't spent. I'm sorry. So the spreadsheet you have, Gail. Yeah. It's not on there because it was a budget item. It was never spent. Okay. So it's in reserve someplace is what you're yes. saying. Okay. Yeah. So if you took that 180 plus the 70 that we have right now from okay. this, this year, plus the, okay. that Your covers that 216 right. in that point in time that Kathy referred to on June 3rd. Okay. Okay. That's so, so we're just asking for the 50 um, okay. because we're still going to, we're, we're going to, We'll be okay for that unfunded liability, but also the group has has money in there for negotiations coming up. Okay. We don't know what that number is, but it's there. Now, is there any way to, to adjust any of the, the numbers like that? Or are there any others that also have kind of way back numbers that aren't reflected on the, the spreadsheet? No, that's the only one, Gail. That's the only one, okay. Thank you. All right, I'm done. Bill? Uh, never mind. <laughs> Paul? 
Pat. Yeah. So Derek, just so that I, I have it clear in my mind, this $50,000 that you're looking to add to this line item is not necessarily to cover the unfunded liability because really that's already covered. Really it's building some money in there in preparation for the negotiations. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Um, I'll chime in. I think, I know Roland was a, and he's not here tonight, he had to be away for work, but I do know he was probably one of the first people to really push for the town. And I think it's the right decision to have um, fund our liabilities rather than being unfunded liabilities. I think we've taken the right steps in doing that. So now the question is starting to, in, and I understand, and I, I think I agree with Derek, I'm pretty sure, um, to try to level out the contract. So is to set aside some money now for negotiations. Um, so it's not such a spike. As you recall, many years we go into contract negotiations and, and, and you don't know where they're going to fall and you don't know what, what's going to be approved and what they're asked for. But this more, this is an attempt to keep the tax rate steady rather than to have spikes up and down. And, you know, the last time I think we set aside like $185,000, but because of the openings we had, it wasn't used, right? But I think, I think in that effort of attempting to keep the tax rate steady, I think this is something I'll come down on in support of. But I certainly am 100% in support of funding our unfunded liabilities. So that's mine. Bill, do you now have another question? Yeah, well, I just remember what I wanted to say. Um, but it's just like the same thing. It's sort of like the analogy that Matt made with the three inch, the five inch pipe, the three inch pipe. You know, you got to have it for when that big hit comes. You got it. And it's the same way. I know there's a lot of debate on this, but. Uh, Again, going back to my previous comment about the uh, the county, they were on the hook for this. I don't obviously, I don't think it ever came to fruition. Um, but uh, yes, I agree with David. I support this, and I agree with David. Um, this needs to be a funded liability, and wouldn't this be something that will be uh, caught by the auditors too, as uh, something we would need to act on anyway if it was unfunded? They would point that out in the report. Right, but it's not it's not a requirement, but it puts a town more at a uh, liability financially because so just hypothetically speaking, if we didn't have the money to cover a unforeseen retirement, where would you get it from the department? Right, from what from their budget? Yes. Okay. All right, that's it. I don't want to drag this on. So thank you. Any further discussion looking around? That would be a no. Derek, what's next? Okay. Um, so in an attempt to keep the tax rate stable, the mill rate, and uh, as the budget was presented to you, I believe the municipal expense increase was about 1.56%. Uh, the other night, uh, we had a reduction of $50,000. So our municipal expenses right now are about a 1.27% increase. Now, part of what I factored in to keep that mill rate stable was the the, uh, the two unknowns, the intergovernmental assessments, one being the SAG County ta uh, tax levy, and the other one's SAG 75. Now with SAG County, um, I didn't get any information yet. I'm sure Matt and, uh, and Ruth may know, or Dave, but uh, I didn't get any indication of what that percent increase would be. So I just planned on 5%, which seemed to be kind of a steady figure throughout the last few years. Uh, in this budget. SAD 75, um, 
la at last year's meeting with the elected officials, they stated that they were didn't see any increase for this particular fiscal year. So at least they were planning on no increase. Um, just prior to the superintendent going on guard duty, um, I spoke to him on the phone. Uh, the finance committee hadn't met yet. They didn't quite know. His statement to me was, hey, maybe 2% increase. I just basically doubled that. Um, so I just I took into account a 4% increase in this budget to keep that mill rate stable. And uh, overlay is uh, unchanged from last year. If uh, when we meet next month with SAD 75, every 1% difference is equivalent to about $111,000. So if it's 1% less than I predicted at 3%, then uh, we're up $111,000. If it's above that, then it's, a, you know, for every percent, it's $111,000 that uh, we didn't account for. Matt or Ruth, Matt, I'm looking through your email you sent out after last week's meeting. Do you guys have anything to chime in early on? The county having a, an IT position and a uh, or part-time IP IT position and a maintenance position, but as this is my first year um, on the BAC, I think Ruth would probably have a better idea about what that would mean for cost. Uh, but Derek, just off the top of my head, five percent looks like an, an appropriate amount to plan for an increase uh, based on what we were told at that very preliminary introductory meeting. Okay, great. Um, that would be my. Uh, assessment too from so far listening and we've got more meetings obviously one more big meeting coming up and I think five percent is a good thing to be looking at the county does have lots of needs and they go very sparingly every year but to me they do not have a lot of reserve money and things need to be fixed there. And if you took a tour of the building and you look at everything, which you will be, Matt, looking at everything in the budget, you'll see that they really work hard to keep it down at the expense of needs. Pat, then Bill, then Gail, I got your hand. Yeah, I, my understanding was that the school district was going to be decreasing the cost by approximately 60% to account for the reduction in education to our children. I don't see that reflected here. Was that understanding unfounded? No, I, I, Pat, I never heard anything. Uh, I spoke to the superintendent before he left. Uh, I didn't get Funny. any information. <laughs> Gail, because Bill took his hand down, you're up. Uh, since we've done such a good job reclassifying or better defining what overlay is, can you give us a better idea as to what that 150000 of the overlay should is going to be spent on? Oh, this is an assessment figure. Um, for? Kathy, can you give a clear explanation? I know what it is. I'm just trying to put it in words. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> I believe it's for uncollected taxes, isn't it? So if it we're is. hoping to get a certain amount, but maybe some people can't pay them, or so this is. I'm the sorry, habit. I lost. I um, <laughs> I was taking a bathroom break. Sorry. Oh, Kathy, yeah, the, the question that, is, uh, can you give a, a good, clear definition for overlay? Or that's. <laughs> Oh, sure. Overlay is um, it's the amount over and above what is legally committed for your taxes. Right. And usually the historical uh, definition was to to make sure that the tax that the tax bills were rounded. But you are legally um, you are legally allowed to commit one hundred and five percent of what you have voted in your meeting. So it can it can range from you know a half a percent up to five percent, and that is um, chosen by the assessor. But what is it used for, Kathy? I think more is the question. 
it goes right to surplus. If it's not used in, in, in Topsum, they use it to fund abatements, which uh, from, yeah. from what I've seen is pretty minimal. So if it's not used for abatements, it goes right back into surplus. Yeah. Oh, Gail, I, that's what I was going to say. In collecting taxes, though she is, the overlay fund is for abatements, just like Kathy said. And for quite a while, we've been very stable on that. And But we do need it there. And it's always been called an overlay for that protection. One year we had to abate 500,000. And so that was a big amount, but 150 is a very good amount, I feel. So is there any reason you can't call it abatement instead of overlay, if that's what it's for? It's, it's a legal term, actually. It's in the yeah. statute. Everything to do with taxes is Title 30 and they really dictate on what and how the wording is in the law. Gail, you're on mute. No, I'm not anymore. Okay, I, I understand that, that that's the legal term, but as far as the spreadsheets are concerned, is there any reason we can't put abatements after that for clarification? I mean, it's it's my, pretty minor, but I mean, for people who are coming on board who have who have no idea what the hell it is, it's a little clearer. Just. I think we actually yeah. have a, a warrant article that tells you that all abatements will be charged to overlay. Yeah, I think I think we're just asking that we put a in parentheses something that we can remember from year to year. We were not working on this daily. We can do that for the budget meetings next year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And just so everyone remembers, um, if we abate anybody's taxes, we abate all the taxes. So we, we, you know, the school budget's 58%, the county's 10%. Any taxes we abate, we abate the entire tax bill, not just the municipal portion of that. So, um, we're the only ones that take the hit when people are unable to pay their taxes or if we abate the taxes. You know, the county gets all of their money every October, all one lump sum, I believe it is in October. And the school district still bills us monthly the same number, but anyone that's not paying, the town's the only people that take that hit. Ruth, you have your hand still? You want something? No, okay. Next, Derek. You're on mute. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this will be the last department we brief on tonight, Department 32 Debt Service. Um, the idea behind this slide is so you can see uh, the remaining debt service that we have here in town. Uh, this year has decreased by a little over $32,000. Uh, next year, it'll be just shy of 100 thousand dollar decrease then you can see how it decreases from there with uh, pretty much most of the debt service being paid off then 27 and then 28 we are debt free this is the last time we have to look at debt service for trucks one of our worst mistakes we ever did So this also can show you, hey, kind of where we stand here as you start planning for uh, any items that maybe need to be bonded. But. You know, this, and I don't want to just keep drumming up talking for the sake of talking, but Bill talked about earlier, you know, if we don't, we don't set aside money, we pay the price later. You look, we, we had to take a bond out for a plow truck and a ladder truck because we did no planning. We had things falling apart on us and we weren't in a position to do it. Um, so again, it, th this is one of those, the, the more we can prep ourselves for the future, it avoids things like this. And uh, that concludes our presentations for tonight. Go ahead, Pat. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, this is Kathy Ricker's first time uh, taking part in these presentations. And uh, there were a number of times over these many nights where, you know, she was very, very value added. Uh, So, Kathy, thank you very much. You know, you were a wonderful addition to, uh, you know, a, a quick response to numerous questions. Thank you very much. Bill? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'll just piggyback on Pat's comment. Yeah, well, Kathy, we've never met. Yes, um, having you available for this uh, fiscal session or finance is much better than it has been in just like every single one for the last 10 years. And I'll just leave that at that. Um, my comment was, it would be fantastic if we could have this debt service um, sheet not change if we could get another out to FY28, which I know this is a pipe dream, but it'd be beautiful if we get to that point of little to no debt. That would be a huge accomplishment. Ruth? Um, I just want to say to Kathy as well, it was wonderful having you here and glad you're on board. But I also want to say, Derek, I think you and Mark have done a great job in understanding. I might not agree with everything, but I still think you've done a wonderful presentation for us. And thank you. All right, folks. Thank you. uh, Oh, sorry. We have concluded another early, oh, 801. Man, last I looked, it was like 735. So I thought we were earlier than that. But We've concluded going over everything. You guys probably have, the Finance Committee have meetings scheduled uh, to go over uh, before reconciliation. Board members, I sent an email tonight because we got cut off the other night. Looking for the planning department, there they are. So uh, we weren't able to schedule our meetings, but I sent an email to everybody tonight on the Board of Selectmen looking for meeting dates so we can do this. We will all be back together on Wednesday, March 17th. Thank you. Dave, I'm making sure it's okay to turn off now.